So uh, with this presentation, I'd like uh, uh, to give you some uh, good nuggets of inspiration for a well-deserved uh, winter break. Um, the technical title of my presentation is a mouthful, but um, uh, the philosophical translation of this title will be, uh, the all is greater than the sum of its parts. So I founded the Space Rendezvous Laboratory um, almost exactly eight years ago with uh, the goal uh, to enable future miniature distributed space systems for unprecedented space science and, uh, and exploration. So a distributed space system is a system made of two or more spacecraft that work together to accomplish objectives, otherwise impossible, very difficult to achieve by a single monolithic system. Um, with today's presentation, I'll provide a few snapshots um, of uh, the motivation behind this work, uh, our research at the Space Rendezvous Laboratory, starting from uh, the four uh, main research pillars of the lab. First of all, we conceive new mission concepts employing multiple satellites. This, um, uh, together with this uh, conception, we derive objectives and requirements that feed the second research pillar, where we develop new algorithms for guidance, navigation, and control and decision making of these multiple space agents to accomplish the objectives. These algorithms are at the intersection of uh, nonlinear estimation, optimal control, machine learning. And the prototypes are uh, uh, validated uh, and or trained using the most recent advances in virtual reality and robotics. Finally, we embed and integrate the algorithms into actual space flight missions. And we are currently working on three space missions uh, uh, with launches in the next one to three years. So um, the idea of distribution is not new and um, uh, we see a, an interesting parallel in nature. Uh, this is a, a video of a flock of birds that I took at um, Half Moon Bay. Um, uh, it gave me the opportunity to explain to my father who was visiting from Italy before the pandemic, um, what is the spirit of my research? And so here you see uh, two or more agents that work together to accomplish an objective that a single one of those agents cannot uh, achieve. Specifically here, the flock of birds mimic the behavior of a big animal to scare off predators. So in order to do that, these agents need to know where to go. That's the guidance problem. They need to know where they are relative to one another. That's a navigation problem. They need to change their motion, their trajectory. That's the control problem. And this is exactly what they do, but with distributed space systems. But the question is why? Is this a biological inspiration of our research? Well. Not quite. Our inspiration comes from two key aspects. First of all, we want to answer fundamental questions. And second, we want to overcome the current limitation of the state of the art that are not able to answer those fundamental questions. So let's have a closer look. Now, there are three areas where distributed space systems uh, promises a major breakthrough. These are in astronomy and astrophysics, in uh, uh, the identification and exploitation of space resources and uh, uh, space exploration, and finally in planetary and earth science. So to give you a symbolic representation, think of an astronaut that is looking up at the sky and is, is asking, is there life out there? Are there habitable planets? Or think of an astronaut looking at high levels and wondering, can we mine, can we um, leverage the immense resources that are available in space? Can we get uh, uh, solar power? Um, how do we manage space traffic, especially in the presence of the proliferation of space debris? Or you can think of an astronaut looking down at a planet of interest, at the Earth, for example, and wondering, how do we do planetary and Earth science? How do we study climate science? What is the composition and how did the celestial object form? Where more specifically, I am listing here specific questions that we are not able to answer today in these three areas. First, we are not able to directly image exoplanets and supermassive black holes. 
An example here is given by an exoplanet, well, the nickname is Osiris in the Pegasus constellation. It's about 159 light years from us. It's the first exoplanet that has been detected with water vapor in its atmosphere using indirect methods. It subtends an angle of one milliard seconds. So to give you an idea, one milliard second is the angle subtended by uh, uh, that spacecraft if you place it on the moon, on the surface of the moon, and you watch it from the Earth. So this is the kind of angular resolution that we need to achieve if we want to answer those questions. In addition, the planet is 10 orders of magnitude dimmer than the parent star, than the host star. It's uh, extremely bright in comparison. To give you an idea, this is like uh, spotting a firefly very close to a lighthouse. Extremely challenging. Second, how do we manage space sustainability? To give you a number, a context, we count 10 to the power of, of six space debris objects, which are of the size less than 10 centimeters, uh, orbiting at tens to hundreds of kilometers per second. These are ticking bombs that are very dangerous. You might have heard on the news what happened recently with the Russian uh, anti-satellite tests um, and uh, the risk posed to the astronauts on the space station. The problem is that we are not able to track these objects and we are not able to reliably estimate their orbits due to their small size. Finally, look at the Earth. We are not able to gain a full understanding of the planets uh, um, as an holistic dynamic system to predict disasters that come from, for example, atmospheric events, um, um, volcanic activity, or you know, earthquakes. The UN has counted 8,000 disaster events affecting 10 to the power of nine people with costs up to $3 trillion of dollars in the last, in, only in the last 10 years. So why are we not able to answer these questions today? Well, what is interesting is that our capability is limited by the laws of physics. There are three constraints that I'm showing here in this slide that are the ones that we need to overcome if we want to achieve those objectives. So let's start from, uh, from the first one, the AB diffraction limit. This specifies a lower bound for the uh, angular resolution that we can achieve. Sigma, you have to see it as an error in your capability to resolve an angle using your instrument. This is uh, driven by, uh, at the denominator here, the diameter of the collecting surface, aperture, and the focal length of your instrument. It's obvious that if we want to decrease this error, we need to increase the denominators. Take an example the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the successor of Hubble. It's 6.5 meters of diameter in terms of collecting area, and it works in the mid to far um, infrared spectrum, microns, three microns or so of wavelength. If you do the ratio, you get 0 0.1 arc second. That's the resolution of the J uh, James Webb Space Telescope, hopefully launching uh, um, yeah, at the end of the year, December, December this year. Um, which is hundreds of thousands of times worse than what I claim we actually need to answer the first question. So question, how do we increase DNF to bring down the angular resolution? I don't give the spoiler right now, but let's move to the second uh, uh, constraint coming from the laws of physics. That's the Tsiolkovsky ideal rocket equation that provides a lower bound for the delta V in meter per second which is the escape speed or the cumulative variations of orbits that we can achieve during a mission lifetime. This is lower bounded by the exhaust speed of the propulsion system, the propulsion technology, and the propellant mass fraction. At the numerator, you see the mass of propellant. At the denominator, you see the dry mass, which is anything else, including the payload. Now, if you want to carry more, so you increase the denominator and you want to accomplish the same mission, you will need to increase uh, uh, the mass of propellant to balance it out. That's why we build huge rockets. Here is an example. This is the biggest rocket that is being built today, Starship. Gigantic, 
But guess what? 95% of the rocket is the mass of propellant, just from the short uh, cost of the rocket equation. So how do we overcome this limitation? Well, either we increase the dry mass, excuse me, we decrease the dry mass, so we decrease the, the denominator to increase the delta V, or we increase the mass of propellant. How do we do that? I don't give you the spoiler right now. So third, um, the third law that constrained us, that boils down to Archimedes first uh, surface area. So the power that you are able to receive for remote sensing from a target, or the power that you are able to transmit to a target for communication, for example. This goes as one over R squared, where R is the distance from or to the target. So if you want to increase the signal to noise ratio, then you need to get closer to the target. However, if you need global coverage, then you look at the number of spacecraft that you need in order to achieve global coverage of a celestial object or a planet. And this goes also as one over R squared. So this means that the only way to increase signal to noise ratio is, uh, and at the same time achieve global coverage, is to get closer and increase the number of satellites. Guess what? This is what the mega constellations are doing with hundreds to thousands of satellites in lower orbit. So if we want to answer those questions, we need to increase these numbers that I'm highlighted here in red. And the way to do that is through distributed space systems. How can they do that? Well, here you see a classification of distributed space systems according to the distance between the satellites and the relative navigation accuracy. How well do we need to determine the relative position and relative velocity of these agents in order to accomplish the mission objective? We can look at one end of the spectrum of constellations that are intended to increase the number of spacecraft. Remember uh, the third the constraint we have. These uh, provide global coverage uh, and they have a relaxed relative uh, navigation accuracy. Examples are SpaceX Starlink, um, uh, OneWeb, uh, Amazon Kuiper, that are going to provide broadband internet, high-speed internet to half of the world population that doesn't have in, uh, high-speed internet today. But here I want to feature Capella Space Constellation, which is uh, a startup founded by uh, a former student of mine deploying 36 small sats. And you understand why we need small sats. If we want to in increase the number of spacecraft and make it still financially viable, we need to decrease the size of the spacecraft. Um, with synthetic aperture radars for 24 seven high resolution imaging of the earth, we revisit times less than one hour, irrespective of weather and illumination conditions. At the opposite end of the spectrum, we have instead the class of missions that try to in, uh, increase uh, the propellant mass fraction. Uh, as I was mentioning before, either you decrease the dry mass, what does it mean? You eject the mass that you don't need. And that's what a multi-stage rocket does in order to increase this ratio. Or in order to put humans on the moon, what we had to do is to do rendezvous in moon's orbit so that we leave the dry mass in orbit and we only uh, sent to the, to the surface what is actually needed there for surface operations. So these are two methods that we can use to increase the dry mass, rendezvous and docking, or we increase the mass of propellant. How can we do that? Well, uh, startups are planning to send uh, gas stations in orbit like OrbFab, or uh, they are planning, to, uh, they are developing low swap size, weight and power technology to prolong the lifetime of space assets by refueling them. Here you see um, featuring Infinite Orbits, which is a startup we are working with, developing small sats uh, uh, to extend the lifetime of geostationary satellites. But the rest of this presentation will focus on uh, these family of missions concepts, formation flying and swans. Why so? Where um, uh, there is an estimate that the, the market associated with Constellation and Rendezvous and Docking, this is going to go towards the three trillions of dollars. So they are very, very well established. Formation flying, swarms, and fractionation, these are new concepts that have, are high risk, high payoff on the, long run, uh, on the long run, which requires a lot of research and development to make it viable. What do they do? They try to increase DNF, which is something we have not addressed so far. 
they create an aperture synthesis or they synthesize an aperture, uh, which is uh, by using multiple spacecraft, which is not limited by the size of the individual spacecraft. So the key method that is used by most of these missions is through interferometry. So what is that? In the origin of interferometry is from uh, the Young's double slit experiment, 1801. Young demonstrated the uh, nature, uh, the wave nature of light. And so what we can do is to make two waves interfere with one another to create an interference pattern at the detector. This interference pattern can be used to generate an image of the source of the electromagnetic wave through a, a two-dimensional Fourier transform. Now, the impressive thing is that the resolution of the image that we obtain through the interference pattern is now lambda over D, where D is not the size of the aperture that is collecting the electromagnetic waves, but it's the distance between the elements that are creating the, uh, the interference. So this interference can be done in a constructive way, in a destructive way, or in a mixed way. And here you see a visualization of that error that we are able to do that is uh, proportional to lambda, the wavelength of light that we are actually observing, and inversely proportional to the distance between the elements that are creating that, uh, 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 that interference pattern. And so imagine if we are able to use two spacecraft to create that interference pattern, or if we are able to use three spacecraft, and so forth. This gives rise to the mission concepts and missions that we're working on in our laboratory and all it, their challenges. So the first mission I'd like to talk uh, about is the Visor's mission. The Visor's mission leverages constructive interference. The goal is to obtain um, uh, extreme ultraviolet images of the solar corona with a resolution down to 0 0.1 arc seconds. You remember, this is the number I attached to the James Webb Space Telescope. But Visors employs two shoeboxes. These are two uh, six U CubeSats satellites in lower form, due launch in 2013 with a cost of $5 million. So how are we able to take these unprecedented uh, images that provide uh, uh, information about the distribution of this active region of the sun, provide information about this energy transport uh, system that are important to predict solar flares, et cetera. Well, we use two spacecraft where one spacecraft carries the optics, which is visualized here, and the second sp spacecraft is the detector. So what is the optics? So this is a photon sieve uh, uh, technology under development at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, you see these holes, so they are arranged in concentric rings. Um, if you imagine that this, uh, these rings uh, um, are just you know, continuous, now you can easily imagine that the front wave that is uh, uh, hitting this, uh, this plate will create a constructive interference. So the, uh, the photons will diffract from from these rings and constructively interferes with one another, amplifying the signal. Now, the almost miracle effect is that the resolution is driven by the distance, the smallest distance between these rings. So manufacturing tolerances, not size directly, and it's inversely proportional to the focal length. So we need a, a long focal length. And that's why we put the spacecraft at 40 meters separation. But in order to achieve this objective, we need to precisely align the spacecraft with the sun, the region of the sun we want to observe, with requirements that you see shown here, plus minus one to two centimeters longitudinal and lateral with respect to the line of sight, and a stability of plus minus two millimeters so over a 10 second period where the image is formed. And we, dis we need to do that using uh, nanosat technology in lower orbit, something that has never been done before. How do we do it? Well, we need to solve the guidance, navigation, and control problems, similar to what I described for the flock of birds. Now, the first innovation that we have introduced in visors is the solution of the optimal guidance problem. Where do the spacecraft need to go? This is an optimal formation flying guidance problem that we can solve analytically 
using models from astrodynamics. What does it mean? Well, here you see two views of the problem. So our unknowns are the absolute orbit elements that describe the orbit of the chi spacecraft and the relative orbit elements, which are combination of absolute orbit elements uh, between the two spacecraft that de describe the relative motion between the satellites. So let's start from a geocentric inertial view where you see the Earth orbiting around the sun. We are looking from the celestial pole. So this is an orbit uh, plane that is edge on um, for, the, for a cheese spacecraft. Uh, and uh, you see the beta angle, the angle between the orbit plane and, and the sun. Um, we cannot, uh, th this, this orbit can be described in terms of its shape, orientation, size, using orbit elements, and it's a section of a cone for the two-body problem. And we can attach a, a co-orbiting frame aligned uh, with the position vector of the spacecraft, aligned with the cross track, the normal to the orbit plane, aligned with the velocity of the spacecraft, so-called an RTN frame. And then we zoom in on that RTN frame and we look at the relative motion between the satellites. So that is now described globally by a combination of the absolute orbit elements of the individual orbits. Specifically, the relative motion between the satellites is a section of an elliptic cylinder for close separation. And it projects into ellipses in the orbit plane of the chief, identified by a radial and a long track direction and in the plane perpendicular to the flight direction, as you can see here. How do we reconcile these two views? By using relative orbit elements, the proper state representation. In particular, relative orbit elements provide a global shape for the relative orbits. And so in order, uh, so the optimal guidance problem has to achieve three objectives. Minimize the delta V, so obtain a, a, a propellant uh, consumption that is compatible with CubeSat. Second, ensure safety at all times, which means that even in the presence of contingencies and hard control failure, uh, there must be a minimum separation guaranteed between the spacecraft at all times. And three, the proper baseline for scientific observations with a proper stability. So what we do, we start, first of all, by finding the location on the relative orbit where the differential acceleration between the satellites perpendicular to the line of sight is zero. Um, and uh, at the same time, we look for the location on the relative orbit where the inertial velocity of the two spacecraft are identical. So it turns out that that uh, configuration corresponds to a, a baseline or a sun that, the, that is line in the plane defined by the velocity vector and the orbit normal. From this local condition, then we can derive the global shape of the relative motion by combination of relative orbit elements. Second, safety. So uh, most of the uncertainties or the largest uncertainties affecting the relative motion happen in a long track direction. That's the unstable mode. And that's uh, where we have uh, differential drag due to uncertainty in the knowledge of atmospheric density. And so uh, we define a, uh, a, an exclusion zone uh, uh, in the plane perpendicular to the flight direction that is um, insensitive to the alone track separation, to those uncertainties. In such a way, if you are able to guarantee a minimum separation between the spacecraft in the plane perpendicular to the flight direction, we have a guarantee that the deputy spacecraft will uh, move on an helicoidal motion around, um, around the chief, uh, uh, irrespective of those uh, uh, uncertainties. Now, um, what is interesting is that we can inflate this exclusion zone. And we find out that the, in, by inflating the exclusion zone, including all the uncertainties that we envisioned before the mission, we restrict the beta angle that we can use for our scientific observation. So we are able to concurrently determine what is the optimal absolute orbit and the optimal relative orbit for our formation. But this is all the, the analytical solution of a guidance probe. Now, all the formation flying concept revolves about that guidance solution. We need to add navigation, remember the flock of birds, and we need to add control. Here you see in a top level view of the GNNC architecture where the two spacecraft exchange raw GPS measurements. I'll tell more about that uh, 
um, later. Um, exchange raw GPS measurements to do precision navigation with an accuracy of a relative position of one centimeter, standard deviation, and relative velocity 25 micrometer per second, standard deviation. I'll tell later how we are able to get there. So the state is fed to a maneuver planner that makes use of two approaches in order to control uh, the trajectory and acquire our optimal guidance. One, closed form solution based on relative orbital elements for course formation keeping and standby. And two, a stochastic model predictive controller um, uh, to achieve the ultimate uh, precision uh, in our acquisition. The stochastic MPC or model predictive controller is very computational expensive. So we reformulate it using relative orbit elements for computational efficiency. In addition, we have a collision avoidance module on the spacecraft because in case that passive shift, so the criteria that I explained before, fails in a worst case scenario, the spacecraft that is not affected by the contingency must be able to perform evasive maneuvers using closed form solutions in a very quick time. So by now we have passed the critical design review of the visor mission. We have conducted Monte Carlo simulations to evaluate the performance of the GNNC system. And you see results shown, uh, key results shown on this slide. On top, you see on the X axis, the um, nominal uh, control errors during observations over 100 Monte Carlo simulations subject to nominal uncertainties from sensing, actuation, and dynamics. And on the y-axis, uh, a cumulative distribution function that expresses the likelihood of uh, achieving that, uh, that control error. Now, if we uh, assume that these errors are, are correlated and we multiply them, we obtain a cumulative success rate of 67% of achieving our tight control accuracy requirement that is larger, much larger than the requirement from the mission that is 20%. So the mission is asking two every 10 of those observation attempts to be successful. And we can do almost seven. However, what about sensitivity? So we have identified through uh, Monte Carlo simulation that the largest source of uncertainty come in uh, for the uh, relative motion control comes from the relative navigation. In particular, we can increase the relative navigation error by 70%, which is from one centimeter to 1.7 centimeters in uh, standard, standard deviation, and still uh, achieve the 20% success rate that is required by the mission. So the question is here, the key challenge, how do we do that navigation? So I'll get to that momentarily, but before uh, getting to the navigation problem, uh, I want to introduce the second mission concept uh, we are working on uh, uh, today. So visors, um, the one I described before is funded by NSF. It's a multi-university collaboration. Uh, MDOT uh, um, uh, is uh, uh, originated from my lab together with Stanford professor uh, Bruce McIntosh and was funded by NASA Astrophysics uh, through a, a pre-phase pre A. Um, we are collaborating with JPL to mature uh, the technology. And it makes use of destructive interference. Pfizer's, remember, was constructive interference. And now we use destructive interference. In particular, we want to observe very dim objects orbiting uh, nearby stars. These are up to 10 orders of magnitude dimmer than the star. So we need to suppress the light from the star. So the objective is to measure for M-DOT, uh, which stands for a miniature distributed occulter telescope, to measure albedo in the UV spectrum uh, from the dust in the habitable zone of nearby stars with that contrast and the uh, resolution of one arc second. Why is that important? Well, because future missions that are trying to find planets similar to the Earth will encounter interference from dust coming from asteroids and comets, which, is, which are very bright. So they are still you know, four orders of magnitude brighter than, uh, than the planets. So we need to characterize them, something that is not available today to the desired degree of accuracy. And so in order to do that, we use a star shade on one spacecraft that creates destructive interference. So it introduces a path delay of the light waves through diffraction, 
specifically the light wave that is coming from the tip to uh, the aperture of the telescope and from the, um, the gap at the, uh, at the bottom uh, to the telescope, uh, it, it is of different length. And that difference of wavelength produces, the uh, if it's very precisely uh, shaped, um, produces destructive interference. Um, it generates a shadow uh, where we need to fly the telescope with an accuracy of plus minus five, 15 centimeters perpendicular to the line of sight. Um, at 500 kilometers from the star shape to obtain the proper inner working angle to observe the vicinity of the star with an accuracy of plus minus five kilometers. So it's more relaxed along the line of sight. So this is uh, um, also foreseen to be launched in lower orbit uh, uh, to reduce the cost. And it's even more challenging than visors because we need centimeter level relative positioning accuracy in 3D between the spacecraft in lower four. So let's review the key technique that we use the, uh, in order to achieve that level of accuracy in lower four orbit, and that's carrier phase differential uh, GNSS. Um, you see here an emitting uh, antenna, a receiving antenna. This is a user spacecraft, for example. This can be a GPS satellite, but it can be also another formation flying satellite if we use it just as a self-contained RF navigation system. And the radio is able to determine uh, through correlation the pseudo range, which is a coarse measure of the range affected by about a meter of noise, two cores for our purposes, and the carrier phase. The carrier phase is basically the location of the receiving antenna within a carrier phase cycle. So this carrier phase has a noise at the level of a few millimeters. And that's what we really need to exploit for precise navigation. The problem is that the carrier phase is affected by a bias. It's an integer number of cycles of wavelengths that is unknown. It's the major unknown we have in this problem. If we are able to determine this integer bias, then we can exploit the carrier phase measurement with that millimeter level noise. How do we do that? To distribute the space system. So we take two user satellites. So in our case, we have them because we have a formation of, uh, of satellites through a crosslink. And we exchange the carrier phase measurements that are obtained from commonly visible GPS satellites. By differencing those carrier phase measurements, we remove core common modes and we obtain a model, a measurement model that is uh, uh, summarized here in this equation. Single difference carrier phase measurement. Um, this is the measurement. R is the motion the relative motion, relative position between the spacecraft we are interested in that we need to estimate. And then we have all these other effects that, that do not cancel out, especially if the spacecraft are far from one another. First is the knowledge of the orbit of the emitting uh, spacecraft, so GPS. This is contained in a navigation message of a GPS satellite. However, is affected by errors that are unavoidable and they do not cancel out our large separation. So we need, the only thing we can do here is to avoid as much as possible linearization of our model, uh, and not to succumb uh, to those errors. The second effect is differential clock offsets between the, uh, the user spacecraft. And we can estimate them as a random work process. Third, ionospheric path delays. So uh, the signals uh, are delayed because they pass through the atmosphere. And when this, the, uh, the user satellites are close to one another, those effects do not cancel out. And that's a differential ionospheric path delay that is vital to be estimated if we want to do the precision navigation at far range. And we do that by using a simple Klobuchar um, ionospheric path delay model that describes you know, the total electron content that is encountered by the signals on their path. And we add a bias, we estimate a bias using, again, a, um, basically a, a, a Markov uh, process of first order. This model is highly nonlinear. Finally, if we are able to isolate those effects, then we can determine the integer number of uh, wavelengths that affect uh, the color phase by solving a least square uh, integer ambiguity resolution problem, which is computationally expensive, but we have uh, 
smart methods such as the lambda method uh, that decorrelates the ambiguities to uh, speed uh, uh, the process up. So finally, we can then estimate uh, using the best possible dynamics model, our motion through a nonlinear filter. Specifically, we use an unstanded Kamban filter because it's the nonlinear filter uh, that is, uh, represents the best trade off between accuracy and computational effort on currently uh, available microprocessor um, uh, for spacecraft. Okay, let's see um, how we assess the performance uh, of our um, uh, precise relative navigation. Um, what we do is uh, to put the hardware in the loop. So we have uh, the GNSS receivers of the two spacecraft. We have the crosslink between the spacecraft. We have uh, the, the microprocessor where we run our algorithms and we feed the RF, the coherent RF signals are coming from the GPS constellation um, to um, uh, directly to the front end of the GNSS receiver uh, to mimic uh, uh, realistic operations. The rest is simulated with a state-of-the-art legacy software available at my laboratory uh, using um, uh, the most uh, uh, accurate force model for the satellite motion. Now here you see some results. At close range, two kilometers separation, similar to a visor's uh, um, configuration, relative position errors in millimeters, and relative velocity error in millimeter per second, um, obtained by comparing the estimate, the real-time estimate on board with a ground truth. Now you can see that after integer ambiguity resolution, that after here, uh, after one orbit is activated, uh, then we can get to a steady state, steady state error uh, that is uh, better than one centimeter standard deviation in relative position and 25 micrometer per second standard deviation in, in uh, um, relative velocity, which is what it's required by the visor's mission. And this is done by fixing almost 98% of the carrier phase ambiguities. Now, what if we increase the separation to 500 kilometers? That's what we need for our M dot mission that, uh, that is uh, uh, shown there. We ruin completely our relative navigation accuracy if we don't consider ionospheric path delays. We get to 20 centimeters of standard deviation and one millimeter per second of error in relative velocity, which is not acceptable. So the key here is to introduce an estimate of the uh, differential ionospheric path delays. And this allows us to regain the full navigation, relative navigation accuracy at 500 kilometers separation with a, an ambiguity uh, fixing uh, success of 95%. Okay, so this uh, concludes uh, just a presentation of examples on the formation flying side. So for the rest of the presentation, um, I'll show instead examples on the swarming that gets even more challenge. For the formation flying, you see the challenge is that the satellites are at large separations with a requirement on relative navigation accuracy that is high. That's the worst case scenario in that, um, in that corner. Swarms becomes challenging because we have many satellites uh, uh, flying within a confined volume. So this uh, brings me to SciFi, pun intended. So that's uh, the name of a mission concept uh, that uh, originates from NASA JPL. I'm uh, collaborating with, it's in a pre-phase A, um, that um, uh, aims at 0 0.1, better than 0 0.1 angular resolution uh, in the frequency coverage of microwave, millimeter uh, wavelength. To, um, to achieve many groundbreaking scientific objectives of the type uh, of a train, uh, you know, um, finding water uh, in um, uh, uh, protoplanetary uh, disks during the formation of planets, all the way to, uh, to planets. Um, this is done by using 10 to 12 uh, small sat uh, with heterodyne receivers. So these are like radios for light um, uh, that. Um, send their signals at high data rates, you know, using terahertz data links to a hub that builds the interferogram. 
So it does uh, the interference pattern by correlating all the signals from, from the spacecraft. Now, this allows, as I explained uh, when I introduced interferometry, the generation of an image, I, uh, here you see the key equation, uh, from a two-dimensional Fourier transform of the amplitude and phase of the, um, uh, of the interference pattern that is measured at different locations, uh, um, uh, which are identified here by uh, U and V, of a plane, that is called the UV plane. The UV plane in radio interferometry is a virtual plane that is perpendicular to the line of sight. So you have to imagine that the uh, position of uh, uh, the spacecraft projects onto a plane that is perpendicular to the line of sight to, to the target. And uh, um, the spacecraft, by, by moving around, they can sample the UV plane. Um, and measure through the interference pattern, the amplitude and phase. Now, the outstanding result is that the resolution of our imaging is now bounded by the maximum distance between the satellites in the UV plane and the minimum distance between the satellites in the UV plane. So this means uh, that if the satellites are separated by five kilometers, so this is equivalent to having a telescope that is five kilometers um, uh, large. So, however, the requirement is to do satellite swarming for UV coverage, um, and there are many challenges. So one uh, uh, of the key challenges is relative navigation in 3D, uh, that is a fraction of the wavelength that is used. Uh, it's about 50 microns, uh, um, which is extremely, extremely challenging. So this uh, will require laser interferometer. So we have started looking at a simpler, challenge that is affecting sci-fi and is the challenge of flying 10 to 12 spacecraft in low Earth orbit to cover the UV plane with minimal delta V usage and safety. So in order to do that without getting into the, into the, the math of the problem, we apply the methodology that we have used for visors and MDOT based on relative orbit elements and we extend it to an n number of space. In particular, what we can do is to um, uh, exploit the additive properties of the relative orbit elements, combination of absolute orbit elements, when they are defined as vectors. Specifically, we can derive algebraic conditions that guarantee passive safety uh, um, and passive stability by placing, stacking together all the relative orbit elements of uh, the satellite of the swarm with respect to a chief that can be real or virtual. And the remarkable thing is, first of all, we have a condition of collinearity to remove uh, um, uh, effects coming from air for blatantness, the drift coming from uh, air for blatantness. And second, look at this angle theta. We can establish a condition of theta that has to be larger than a value that is driven by the separation uh, we establish between the relative orbit elements and epsilon, which is our exclusion zone in the plane perpendicular to the flight direction. And in such a way, we guarantee that there will be a minimum separation between all spacecraft of the swarm um, in the plane perpendicular to the flight direction, even in the presence of uncertainties or contingencies, if we make epsilon large enough. So let's have a look at some results when we attach a controller to that guidance solution. So on top, uh, you see uh, 10 uh, satellites modeled uh, uh, using nanosats, like from the planet uh, constellation. Cartesian state description. This is the orbit plane of the virtual chief in radial and along the direction. And that's the plane perpendicular uh, to the orbit of the virtual chief. And you see here that relative positions are very rapidly varying. An equivalent description that we use is in relative orbit elements that are slowly varying. And that's where we define our control, much easier. As long as theta, the angle between the relative eccentricity vector and the relative inclination vector is uh, confined, then we guarantee a separation between the spacecraft. But then when we violate the constraint, you see, we cannot have a minimum separation between the spacecraft in the plane perpendicular to the flight direction. So we activate a controller that is just a 2D controller for the remaining two relative orbit elements. 
so to achieve that safety in the orbit plane using a simple bang bang nonlinear control law. So we have translated a multi-dimensional problem to just a 2D controller um, um, uh, using this technique. Oh, the, the interesting part is uh, that we need to uh, activate the controller only for a short time while passive safety is not guaranteed. Then as soon as we recover our uh, theta angle, then uh, uh, we don't need to control the swarm anymore. So I'll uh, conclude uh, the presentation uh, with uh, the last example of a swarm that departs a little bit from interferometry, but follows similar principles of using the relative motion between multiple spacecraft to characterize the environment as uh, um, uh, cannot be done using a single spacecraft. And that's our ANTS mission concept that uh, is funded by the NASA's most spacecraft technology development program. ANTS stands for Autonomous Nanosatellite Swarming Using Radio Frequency and Optical Navigation. Now, what is the idea here? So we want to recover shape and gravity of small celestial objects like asteroids to understand their composition. Imagine hoping through the, uh, um, the asteroid belt in search of uh, um, rare materials or precious materials. In order to do that, we need to determine shape and gravity so to constrain the density of the, of the object. Um, and we can do that autonomously using multiple spacecraft by considering, first of all, stereo, uh, stereo vision. So if you have two cameras looking at the same feature on the ground, you can do stereo vision. And if you know the 3D uh, position of the feature, you can recover the motion of the satellites or vice versa. If you know the motion of the satellites, you can recover the 3D position uh, of the feature on the ground. So you can go two ways. Similarly, gravimetry. Look at two spacecraft here. They are pulled by the gravitational potential of the asteroid, uh, consider an anomaly here for uh, visualization purposes, where uh, uh, the leader spacecraft is pulled more than the trailer. And here, after some time, uh, the trailer spacecraft is pulled more than the leader. So this means that the relative motion between the spacecraft act as a spring that can be used to sense the gravitational field. Um, so in the same way, like stereo vision, if we know the motion of the satellites, we can recover gravity. The other way around, if we know the gravitational field of the asteroid, we can recover the motion of the asteroid. So in ANTS, we put all together. So we describe shape and gravity through spherical harmonic expansion so that we can reduce the number of degrees of freedom we have. In particular, the coefficients of the spherical harmonic expansion um, can be estimated to a certain degree and order according to our objectives. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and you see how uh, the shape and gravity are a function not only of these coefficients, but also you know, the location of the spacecraft is shown by R, by um, um, longitude and latitude. So we do that by using RF links between the satellites for information on the baseline and using short range camera that uh, image common features on the ground for a stereo vision. So the GNNC architecture is uh, more challenging than for the previous missions because um, the guidance problem cannot be solved analytically in this case. It's a very complex optimization problem that we try to solve through deep reinforcement learning, through training of a neural net uh, on ground, so that uh, the estimator can provide the state and covariance information. The neural net, based on that information, can decide what is the best trajectory for the swarm for uh, shape and gravity recovery that is then tracked by our controller based on relative orbitals. This is the last uh, results I'm going to show today to give you an idea of the potential of this architecture in estimating, uh, um, in this case, the gravity of a small celestial object autonomously. You see the Eros asteroid, which is the uh, you know, best known asteroid uh, today. You see three swarming satellites uh, arranged through relative orbital elements for passive safety, tracking common features on the ground, the, the red dots and estimating the uh, 
gravitational field of the asteroid up to uh, degree 10. And here you see plotted the um, um, root mean square through error in the estimation of the gravitational coefficients. And you see two trends. First of all, when you move uh, from uh, the straight lines to the dotted lines, we have orders of magnitude of improvement in gravity recovery when going from 50 kilometers altitude to 35 kilometers altitude. And that speaks for autonomy. The more autonomous we are, the closer we can get to the asteroid and the better we can, we can, we can recover gravity. Second, you see the jump going from uh, dots uh, to um, uh, diamonds. Dots represent a single spacecraft, the diamonds represent a swarm of three spacecraft. And you see an improvement of you know, orders of magnitude one to two in the accuracy in the gravity record. So we are preparing for uh, hardware in the loop validation of the ANS algorithms using our robotic test. Um, we have two robotic arms that can be used to reproduce the scene with a tumbling asteroid and the satellite orbiting around the asteroid that we can calibrate to very high precision in order to evaluate our algorithms. And uh, I will con conclude this presentation uh, uh, by spending a few words, a few credit lines to who made uh, all these results possible. So first of all, my students at the Space Rendezvous Laboratory, all this material is an extract from tens of conference and journal publication and thesis by my students, which are available at slab.stanford.edu and the sponsors, mainly NASA, NSF, FRL, FOSR, and the Center uh, of Excellence in Aeronautics and Astronautics. So thank you very much for the attention, and I'm uh, happy to answer uh, your questions. Thank you.